Okay, hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today again. And I hope that you have really had a good experience with the homework exercises that we proposed in the part one and in the part two. For you to get started using parallel work tools, both trainer and analyzer, to parallelize uh, your code. So the idea today is that uh, we will be here for five hours, I think. And the idea is to that we can work with you to try to see uh, how you can get started to use parallel work tools with your own, your own code. And just in case you don't have a code or the code may seem too complex or just for five hours, we have proposed uh, an example code called CPIC. I will go into the details of this uh, code in a few minutes to propose you as uh, hands-on. So we will provide you now a step-by-step -step guide of the how to parallelize the CPIC uh, code, starting from sequential code written by, a, by the developer, no previous requirement on the properties or the coding style for the source code, and how you can go from there to the four basic parallel versions for CPU using multi-threading and OpenMP, for GPU using offloading with OpenMP and OpenETC. So the idea is to uh, guide you and describe that journey, because after that, we will provide you just with a one slide of instructions of how you can typically optimize the performance of the CPIC uh, parallel code. And for that, you have all the concepts and all the materials that you need in the contents of the parallel work training series of last year, 2019. So we have tried to cover something new that is going from zero to having the first basic parallel version of the code today. So that is the, the main uh, journey that we will uh, go through today. So, um, and of course, in the end, we want to close the loop and see how we can relate this to where we started. We started talking about codes, motives, parallel work patterns, how they are useful to understand and discuss potential performance of my applications on CPUs and GPUs. Okay, so we will first present you the key concepts behind the steps of the guided parallelization for CP code. Uh, after that, uh, Javier, my colleague at Apentra, will show some commands of parallel work analyzer tools to analyze the CP code. And then I will close this part of the session uh, presenting you a discussion of what's the performance you might expect and a comparison of the type of SPAR reduction we find in CPIC with the type of SPAR reduction that we find in other codes that we have studied in the, in the past, like ATMAX or the Lulesh MK code. So we will discuss how they relate somehow so we can understand why some of them provide very good performance, even the basic a parallel implementation and others, in others we struggle to accelerate the software. Okay, so we hope to close that at most in the upcoming hour. And then we have four hours ahead to work on the hands-on with CPIC or with your own code. So at some point, if you are interested in trying with your own code, we would really would appreciate that you tell us through the chat of Zoom or the chat of the Slack channel that you are intending to work on your own application so that we can understand how many people we might need to support you to get started during these hours. Okay, so please, if you're intending to do so, let us know as soon as possible. Okay, so part one and part two are already done. We really hope that you found the homework useful to get started with parallel sparse reductions with a pattern with the different parallelization strategies and how this can help you to reason on about how to code your applications using OpenMP and OpenACC to go to the GPU and in the middle go through the multi-threaded CPU as well. Okay, so today, as we said, we focus on one use case, CPIC code, and, uh, and if possible, with your own code. So what is CPIC? 
Okay, CPIC is available uh, publicly in these uh, GitHub repositories. So we, we started to prepare these materials starting from a, a clone of this uh, CPIC version. So no previous modifications on the code be, uh, before we start to work on it, okay? And the version is the last available in October, so just a few weeks ago. So what is CP code? CP code, uh, PIC stands for particle in cell. So these are codes with a, or a, a scientific uh, simulation technique using many areas like plasma physics, fusion energy research, plasma accelerators, ion propulsion or plasma processing. So essentially, this is, these are particle methods. So instead of all the particles interacting with all the particles, at some point, a set of particles are confined in a cell. So the code is based on understanding and processing the interactions of the particles confined in one cell and divides the whole uh, simulation domain in, in cells. Okay, so this is why it is called particle in cells. In particular, the CP code is re in reality a set of, a suite of codes that uh, solve 1D and 2D fully relativistic, relativistic electromagnetic codes using the particle in cell technique, okay? So here you can see that it is written in the C programming language and the, you can access uh, five uh, directories that correspond to different problems, 1D and 2D problems using finite difference or spectral uh, methods. In particular, for this uh, exercise and this training, we have focused on the code EM2D, which is 2D electromagnetic finite difference code. And in particular, this code is complex enough to, to parallelize and complex enough to be managed in a training session like the one we are conducting today. And the reason is mainly its size. 14 files, more than 190 functions, more than 140 loops, that some more than 4,000 lines of code. So imagine getting, uh, starting to work in this code without no guide, without no uh, tool or software that can help you to do so. The learning, the startup uh, time is, can be really, really time consuming, okay? So um, it's important always, whenever you parallelize or you optimize your codes, to know two things how to build and how to run the code. And particularly interesting is the, the third thing, that is how to verify the correctness of the code. This can vary from one field to another, to one code or another. So verif sometimes verifying scientific software is not easy because it cannot be uh, reproduced like in stochastic processes, for instance. So in this case, we have selected the CP code, in particular a workload called Wavell, that contains uh, boxes or cells of 128 particles by 128, uh, sorry, eight particles in boxes of 128 by 128 in their size. Okay, these are highlighted on the right. These are parameters of the scientific problem you will be compiling, running and simulating today. In practice, we need to compile the code so you have available the CPIC code in a compressed TGC, TGC file that we have shared with you. You can uncompress it, just go to the CPIC directory and inside it, you will find a PW directory. We have added this because we are providing you from the very beginning, all the versions that you will, we will uh, describe in this uh, presentation of the hands-on exercise, okay? So in this case, for the starting version zero, that is serial code, you can compile and run the code just following these four commands. Change into the build directory, running CMake, running make clean, make, and just running the binary, CPIC. And the simulation will start. So we will go through 500 steps, providing you a numerical magnitude T. So you need to verify that whenever you run in parallel in your versions for each of these steps, this T value is uh, finally the same to the sequential version, okay? And in the end, you also have the simulation time and the 
execution time of the of the code. Okay, so we have everything prepared for you. You just need to uncompress it, follow this set of steps, and you can get started with building, running, and verifying different versions of the CPIC code. Okay, if you have any doubt, of course, contact us at at any time. Okay, so if you remember, we started uh, last week saying that we are we have designed these tools, parallel work tools, are one pillar of a whole approach that is based on the second pillar, that is a catalog of defects and recommendations and opportunities that are identified by the, by the tool. So the tool provides you an automation of the tedious time-consuming task of scanning your code, trying to find if the code matches several properties, okay? So, but you can do everything without the tools. The, the approach itself is for development of C++ Fortran code, particularly at parallel code. And if you remember, we said we have three stages. Stage one, prepare the code for parallelism. What do I need to do in my code, in the implementation, before adding parallel pragmas in op using OpenMP or OpenACC? Okay? Don't care about performance. Care about clean code that the tools can understand, that uh, match the features or the requirements of OpenMP or OpenACC programs and clauses. That's your purpose in stage one. We will go through several steps in stage one. In stage two, once the code is prepared, you start to find opportunities for parallelization. So you can create the first parallel version. You don't care about performance at this point, just generating correct code that runs hopefully faster. But if it is slows down, it's not something rare. It's something that happens many, many times when you get started, especially for GPUs. And finally, we have the optimize step, the optimize your parallel code number three, where we can optimize the code in many different ways. Okay, So following this three stage schema, what we will present you today is a set of changes you can do in the code during stage one. And you will see that we will uh, understand and use techniques like inlining, outlining, array of structs, independent arrays, uh, fusion, fission of loops, this kind of typical code changes that you can do and how they can benefit preparing your code before starting to add parallel semantics. So we will go through stage one in detail. Once the code is prepared, you will see that the tools begin to provide you with parallelization opportunities. So in stage two, we will tell you how to generate three basic parallel versions, CPU multi-threading using OpenMP, GPU offloading using OpenMP and OpenACC. And we will benchmark these three versions. And we will stop there for, for today, for the proposed hands-on. In the end, for stage three, for the optimization of the performance, we will provide you with several um, instructions of what you can do to optimize and improve the performance of these basic parallel versions. But going from zero to stage two, covering stage one and stage two is enough for the training, for the part three of this training course. Okay? So let's begin with uh, part stage number one, preparation of the code for parallelism. Okay, you can do this process by brute force. You can take the 14, the 4,000 lines of code of CPIC find every loop you find there and begin to work on it. But as usual, in, in parallelism and particularly in scientific codes, it is always recommended to do a hot spot guided parallelization process. So this applies also for a stage one of the preparation of the code. So typically, uh, step by step, you profile and identify your hot spots. The hot spots are the, those sections of the code that consume most of the runtime of the application. Once you have those hot spots, you will typically select two, three, four loops where you concentrate your effort. With that, you need to analyze each of those loops, implement parallel code, compare performance, optimize it, and iterate until you get the performance that you need. Okay? So for stage one, and to guide all the process, we start by profiling the CPIC EM2D code. So in order to profile it, we, we are using, as it is sequential code, simple code from that perspective, we are just using GPROF because it's available in most systems and in your laptop or workstations. 
So here, what you can see is that TPROF provides you two outputs, two ways of un understanding the hotspots. What TPROF calls the flat profile, just a flat list of the functions ordered by functions that consume most of the runtime in decreasing order of this execution time. So for instance, you can see that spec advance consumes more than 50% of the code runtime. Then we have interpolate that goes to for 22% and then current thumb that goes for 19%. Tprof also provides you a second view, what it calls the call graph uh, view. Essentially what it does is, it doesn't provide you a flat list of functions because we need to know, understand how these functions are called within the code. So here you can see that spec advance that sums for 50%, more than 50% of the runtime in, in the code, in the source code also includes calls to interpolate FLD and depth current thumb. So in general, we have three hotspots, but they are not independent from each other, but one of them, spec advanced, also contains the other two hotspots. So whenever we take a look at hotspots, we need to analyze them in the context of the flow of the code, at least in particular in the context of the loops that invoke and run these hotspot functions. And this is what we present a sketch here. So here you can see kind of a call graph where you see a spec advance that takes 50% of your time contains one loop, one loop with function calls. And this loop contains calls to interpolate FLD and the current thumb. Interpolate FLD has zero loops. So in general, interpolate FLD is not a candidate for you to start working on parallelism because it doesn't contain any loop. You could need to analyze if interpolate FLD is invoked concurrently many times and see how you can parallelize that. Okay, but we are not targeting this that kind of uh, concurrent parallelism. And the current thumb you can see that contains one function, one loop with no function call. So one loop, simple loop that might be processed by tools. So in general, what we can see is that we have three hot spots, but in reality we have two loops. So two loops that are nested loops. The loop in, inside the current thumb is called is run whenever the current sun is invoked for each iteration of the outermost loop included in spec advance. So what I try to put on the table here is that do not focus blindly of, on the list of um, hotspot functions reported in this case by GPROF. Try to understand the flow of the application to see the relationships between these hotspots. If we understand these relationships, the procedure calls together with the loops of the code, what we can see is that we can use an incremental approach to guide the parallelization process. We can follow a bottom-up approach of this decorated or enriched call graph. We can say, okay, interpolate FLD contains no loops. I decide to ignore it from the point of view of parallelism. It's not relevant for me. So from three, only two hotspots are remaining. From the two hot spots, we have one nested with inside the other the other one. So, if you want to exploit uh, fine grained parallelism, you should focus on the current thumb probably. But to go to the GPU and to go to multi-thread CPU, you generally want coarse grained parallelism. So, big loops with a lot of computation that can be parallelized efficiently. Okay. So essentially, we have done that, that part of the work for you. And if you try to parallelize the current thumb, you will see that the code slows down very, very significantly because each of these loops runs for just 0 0.00 something seconds. So very, very little time to, be, to benefit from parallelism. And this function is called more than six, 65 million of times in CPIC. So, you can try it yourself, try to parallelize it. You will see that the runtime increases very, very significantly. So doing this analysis in the end and this bottom-up approach of this graph, you can finally say, I discard interpolate FLD hotspot because it doesn't contain loops. 
I discard the current Thap hotspot because its loop has very, very few uh, iterations are very few computational loads. So I will concentrate on spec advance and trying to exploit a very constrained parallels. Okay. And as a whole, spec advance contains calls to the other hotspots. So as a whole, it sums up for more than 97% of the runtime of the code. So that is definitely the part of the, the code section of CPIC that you need to parallelize. Okay. Okay, so once we know this, we know we are going to concentrate on spec advance, one single loop. So this is the journey that we are going to describe uh, today. So we start with a serial version and we go through version one, two, three, four. All of these versions are working on changing the, the serial code. We're not talking about parallelism. We are talking about the stage one, preparing the code for parallelism, applying typical techniques, that experts in parallel programming and experts in GPU programming use in real applications, particularly inlining functions, outlining functions, gather, scatter, data sparse in memory into consecutive arrays, change array of structs by separate arrays, and loop fission. And these techniques are in general applicable and very useful both in multi-threading programming, in GPU programming, but also in SIMD vector programming. Okay, so they are really useful. It's really useful to understand them and how to apply them. Okay, so let's start with the serial version. What you will find is in this step by step guide that you have in the in the in the in the materials, you will see that all the sections begin with running PW report or PW loops. For you to understand where you are and how to improve, where and where you want to go, and how much you can improve in terms of parallelization opportunities. Okay. And uh, in this case, we can see that we have uh, 11 loops and a code coverage of 5% in terms of functions. But this is not really a problem. The problem is in this 5% of code analyzable by parallel work. Do we have the spec advanced hotspot routine? Because if that is the case, we are ready to go to stage two and explore parallelization opportunities. So we are not there. So parallel where PW loops can tell you the list of loops. And if you remember, we said we have three key concepts when we use parallel where tools. We need to know if the code is analyzable, is the first, the second column of this table, the output of PW loops. And we can see here that the code is not analyzable. So there is something in the code that we need to change to unlock the parallelism features of parallel web tools, and in, particular, and in general of OpenMP or of compiler tools. Okay, And this is where we are going to concentrate, putting an X in this column, trying to make the code analyzable. Okay, So um, essentially, what you can see here is that whenever you run PW loops with minus minus non-analyzable to know the reasons that are preventing parallel work from analyzing the code, it, essentially tell, it is essentially telling you that you have problems with pointers to extracts. We know this is a nightmare for parallelism and for compilers and for OpenMP because the tools never know if pointers can overlap when they are the reference during the execution of the code. It's very challenging to disambiguate that uh, information for a, for a tool automatically. So this is challenge number one. And challenge number two is you have procedure calls, as we already know, interpolate FLD and DEP current thumb. So what we need to do is solve these two problems, pointer to structs and function procedure calls. So in the step number one, we are going to provide to, to describe how to use two techniques, outlining, and gather scatter. I, I here just want to tell you what these techniques are and why, why they are useful for parallelism. Okay. So, if we want to make a, an incremental approach to parallelism, whenever we touch or make modifications to the data type of our application, imagine that we have a class or a struct with many fields, and one of the data types of these fields is changing. This usually has impact across hundreds of function calls, hundreds of function parameters, 
whenever we change one single field or data type, we need to propagate all those changes across the whole application. So we want to minimize that, okay? So how can we minimize that if we need to convert array of structs into, into consecutive pointers? So for that, we are using a, a technique called gather scatter technique. This has been traditionally applied in the scope of SIMD vector execution, but it is also very useful, as you will see, for real applications for multi-threading and GPU. So, first technique that you need to apply, outlining. Outlining is, you have, we have a defect, a recommendation for this in the catalog, where essentially you can isolate one loop and isolate it from other parts of the code that may be doing pointer arithmetics or pointer aliasing to isolate them to in one separate function with simple arguments that are typically flat 1D arrays. So in this case, you can see that the computation of the loop at lines 15 and 18 has been outlined to a bar uh, function with a simple signature, double pointer A. And this is already analyzable by compilers. Okay, so this is the purpose of outlining. Enable other transformations, particularly isolating the part of the code that, where I want to focus, that I want to parallelize, isolate it from other parts of the code that may be introducing potential pointer aliasing that defeats the best uh, compilers and static code analysis tools. Okay, so this is the first technique and I will not go through this step. And the second technique is gather scatter. What is gather scatter? In CPIC, you have pointers to extracts that contain more pointers to extracts that finally contain a 1D or 2D arrays. So all of these pointers that are referencing through extracts is very complicated to analyze. And you can see the data that you want to process spread across different parts of the memory of the computer. So somehow the, the data is sparse in the, in, the, in the memory of the computer. So what we want to do is create, allocate consecutive arrays and copy the data to this temporary consecutive 1D arrays. Once we have these arrays, we can process this 1D arrays exploiting locality and consecutive data. And finally, we need to do the scatter. The scatter does the opposite operation that is, uh, once we have the results, copy the results into the memory locations that are spread across the memory. So this is key for performance in vector computers or in SIMD computations. And it's also very important to enable an incremental parallelization of big codes because you can avoid changing the whole source code and you just need to change that part of the code that, affect, that is affected by the hotspot loop that you want to analyze, okay? So this is why we propose as a step one, outlining and gather scatter. The ideas may be clear, but applying it is really in general time consuming. You can see here the complexity of the structures, of the structs that we find in CPIC. We basically have three structs, T species, T EMF, T current, with tens of uh, fields that are scalar fields, array fields, more pointers to structs. So in general, it is, Time not difficult, but it's time consuming to apply both in line outlining and um, gather scatter. Um, so here you can see uh, the type of code you need to type to implement gather scatter and on the outline uh, algorithm. And in the case of CPIC, there is also some additional complication that is outside the hotspot data memory is reallocated to adapt to the interactions with the particles somehow. So indeed, in the, you need to do additional uh, complex, more complex implementation of the gather scatter to manage this reallocation uh, of memory, okay? So finally, how does this all glue together in the CPIC application? You can see the original spec advanced application, a routine that is the hotspot with some code and Spec advanced outlining is the outline uh, loop that concentrates 95% of the runtime. 
And before invoking spectral plans outlining, we need to apply gather scatter. This is done by these two routines, pack spec, copy in all data. And finally, we do the need to do the scatter, which is done in copy out all data and pack spec. Okay. This way you can see the structure of a code applying outlining combined with gather scatter to avoid having to recode a major part of the files and functions of the your real application. So uh, for this, if once you run this, you can see that you have one more loop, a uh, hotspot loop, but it is still non-analyzable. And you can check this with the hotest with the PW loops and PW report. Uh, parallel work tools. So in the step-by-step -step guide, you have all the invocations that you need to run on the different versions of CPIC that we provide you as part of the training. So let me move then to step number two. I just want to introduce you all the transformations that you need to understand and, 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 and learn how to apply them. So once we have applied outlining and the gather scatter, we need to do inlining. So what is inlining? Somehow it's the opposite to outlining. In this case, we have a full function. And before inlining, we have a loop that calls this full function. What is inlining? Is replace the call site, the call to the function foo, by the code itself of the function body. Okay? So multiple calls to foo would lead to different copies of the body of the function. So it may grow significantly the size of our codes if we apply uh, inlining many, many times. So inlining is easy in concept. The question is when sometimes it is useful to apply inlining, but sometimes it can be counterproductive because applying inlining typically makes dependence and data flow analysis much more complicated for the developer and for the tools. So we need to always be very careful when we apply inlining. So by principle, in parallel where tools, we usually try to avoid recommending doing inlining. When we recommend it, because we know it has impact in, in making things easier now, but more complicated later when we try to find parallelization opportunities. So when do we recommend this? Whenever it is limiting the detection of patterns by parallel. So this is what happens in this case. In this case, we have a sparse reduction that is updated in the function depth current thumb. And we can do many pattern detection, but at this moment, we cannot still make this pattern detection across procedure calls that modify the reduction array. So we use it to expose the, reduction, the sparse reduction in the main loop so that parallel work tools can analyze and, and recognize this pattern and detect new parallelization opportunities. This is the single case where we at this moment are recommending using inline to overcome this temporary limitation of the detection of patterns in, in parallel. So this is how the code could look like. In the left before inlining, the real code of CPIC and the function call to the current thumb replaced by the whole function body. So you can see that the size of the loop grows significantly due to this. But we have this benefit. We can now see if parallel can detect the pattern, the sparse reduction pattern that we have in the code. So finally, whenever you run PW loops and PW uh, loops with minus minus non-analyzable, you will see that, that, that now you have two loops instead of one. One is the outermost loop, and the other one is the second nested loop that was hidden inside the current thumb. Now the two loops are explicit in the uh, hotspot function. So you get this in the report, but still both of them no, not analyzable at this moment. So we need to do something else. So again, PW report is your friend, PW loops for the listing of loops to find those that are already analyzable, are opportunities. And if not, then run PW loops minus minus non-analyzable to know the reasons behind the scenes that are preventing the code from being analyzable by parallel. So if you invoke PW loops minus minus non-analyzable, it points you to the next limitation that CPIC has. It is using an array of extracts. And this is not good in general for parallelism, not for offloading, not for multi-threading, not for CMD vector execution. So we need to address this and 
remove this array of structs. And this is the step number three, change the array of structs by separate uh, consecutive arrays. So in this case, this is something that we already have as a recommendation. And in general, it is easy to implement. You have typically an array of 100 elements here, and each element if has a struct with coordinates, x, y, z in the example. What you need is to create three separate arrays, points underscore x, points underscore y, points underscore z, z. So in this case, you have three arrays with the coordinates of each point. From the perspective of the data structure representing the real world, is not the best design of a data structure. From the perspective of understanding how the computer processes the data, it is a, a, better, a better way to, to implement the data type, okay, the data structure. So this is what you need to apply here. Here you have a, a, a screenshot of the changes you need to do in the code. So that finally, the code now is analyzable. You can see that by removing, by outlining, gather scatter, inlining the function call, and doing the array of structs, and replacing it by separate arrays, now both loops are analyzable by parallel. So these are typical challenges that you have in any compiler, in any statical analysis tool that wants to help you to generate parallel code. So this is not something specific of parallel, it's general of tooling in, gen in general. So we are almost there. We are almost ready to go to stage two. Manu, so, there's a question about what yeah. the compilers not do the inlining automatically for you. This is uh, where in a question in Slack. Slack. Yes. Okay. Uh, not it, it is compilers by default should not by default make inlining for you in all the cases. Because in many situations, what they will do is they will inline functions where it is not needed. So in some cases, the compiler has its own heuristics to decide whenever a function call is in line. Some compilers even provide a specific pragmas to instruct the compiler to replace one particular function call, not all the call sites of a given function or procedure because they know this can be counterproductive in general. So the, in general, the, let me read the question, please. Give me one second. In general, does the compiler not usually do the inlining for you? My answer should be is it should not because it can be counterproductive for parallelism. Um, it should report you when the inlining is a major limitation for parallelism or for optimization and provide you mechanisms for you to instruct the compiler to inline a given call sign, not all the call signs of a given function, okay? Um, also the programming languages have uh, keywords like inline to, for you to specify when a function can be inline. And this makes the, comp the compiler during the compilation process force the compiler to inline all the function calls to a given function. So typically inlining is beneficial when you have very small functions that for instance receive two arguments, scalars and return another scalar because these functions are really many times hiding parallelism and preventing data dependencies from being effective. So in many situations you can instruct the, through the language keyboards or the compiler to inline several functions, but in general, it should not inline all the functions of the loops that tries to optimize. The compilation process will be extremely low in general, and it could lead to ugly code that will make it very difficult to understand in terms of dependencies and data flow. Okay, so benefits on, for some uh, objectives, but uh, counterproductive for other objectives. So in general, in parallelism, you need to be selective when applying inlining. That's our in general, best practice recommendation. I think there are other questions a question in the Zoom chat. Oh no, it's you, Helen, just saying that they can feel free to make questions. Right, I'm just people uh, to join Slack. Okay, excellent. 
Okay, so, um, okay, let's continue. So remember, uh, we have find a sequence of application of typical transformations that are used to prepare the code to this, so that tools can discover and manage the parallelism available in the codes. Outlining, cutter scatter, inlining, change array of structs by separate arrays. And now let's see one, one final one, loop fission in this case. Okay, loop fission is very simple in the sense, in, in the concept, that is, I have a big loop that computes several results, X and Y arrays in the slide. And I want to make the loop fission, that is, split the loop body in different parts and duplicate the loop header so that now I have one loop for computing X, another loop for computing Y. Again, is loop fission always beneficial? It depends. Sometimes it can be beneficial, sometimes it cannot. So when do we recommend the use of loop fission? In this case, whenever you have a loop with a, a part of the code of the loop body that can be parallelized and another part of the code of the loop that cannot be parallelized, this is the example here, you have a formal pattern that can be parallelized and a recurrence pattern that in general cannot be parallelized. But in particular, in this case, it could be parallelized with a less effective approach like this a par parallel preface computations. But let's consider for simplicity, this kind of recurrences not parallelizable. In this case, you will have one loop that cannot be parallelized. You can help the tools by splitting the loop into two loops. One now is parallelizable through the for all strategy and the other one is just going to be executed sequentially. Okay, so loop fission for this purpose, separating parts of the code that can be parallelized from those that cannot is, is useful, okay? And this is what happens in, in, in CPIC. You can see this sparse uh, comma NA pattern, the second column of PW loops that is telling you in the whole body, I recognize one sparse reduction and there is something that I could not recognize as a pattern. So we suggest that you use PW loops with a data scope in detail to that provides you all the variables and tells you exactly what variables could not be detected as patterns so that you can split the code and separate those variables into one loop and the rest of the computations goes in a second loop. And this essentially what you have to do here, split the loop by this point and replicating the loop header and split the computations that are parallelizable from those that cannot be detected as patterns by parallel. Okay? And with this, you can see that finally we have a loop with two patterns that we already know, sparse, reduction, and for all pattern. And we know how to parallelize them. And the tool can generate parallel code for you. And it provides you information saying, this is a multi-opportunity. You can implement this with multi-threading and offloading. And it's auto-parallelizable in the sense that we have strategies to help you implement this uh, loop in parallel. Okay? So now we have come to the point where the loop is understandable, it's analyzable. We have the patterns, we have the opportunities. So we can go to stage number two, that is creating your parallel version. Remember, we don't want performance yet. We want to know how to parallelize it and later we will care about performance. So here we, we suggest that now using the tools, you focus on that loop and you play with different parallelization strategies for CPU, GPU, OpenNP and OpenACC. Okay, and we consider the generated, the versions generated by the parallel tools, the basic ones that you can generate at this moment. So you can expect the CPU OpenMP version with Atomic to speed up by 1.2 using the Clan compiler. You can expect the G basic GPU with OpenACC and Atomic to speed up a bit more, almost 1.5. And the OpenMP version on the GPU to speed up by one, up to 1.35x. Okay, so this is a good starting point. 
because it is the first time you have a ver parallel version of CPIC. So having the possibility to speed it up is really uh, a good, uh, good feeling because if you remember in the homework of the AT Max example, you started with a bad performance, a slowdown of the application, okay? And with this, we complete all the path that you're going to cover, covering the main, the most, some of the most important code changes and transformation that you need to understand to prepare the code, discover the opportunities and apply using the patterns, implement the parallelization strategies. So if you have time or interest or you want to discuss more about that, once you have this, you, can, you could explore different possibilities in stage three. You can optimize according to different uh, criteria. So here we just give you some hints of what you can do. Based on this baseline of these basic versions for OpenMP CPU, you can try the explicit privatization technique. You could probably get better performance than with Atomic. This was covered in the training courses of last year. You can also suggest to also, that you also paralyze the second loop that resulted from the fissure. That parallel work cannot detect the pattern doesn't mean that it cannot be parallelized. So we are working on covering that pattern, that codification of the pattern, but we can tell you that this is a foral pattern, so easy to parallelize, just pragma when p parallel for. With that, you will cover not one loop, two loops of the hotspot. So you can expect here more improvement in performance. And finally, in the CPU, with OpenMP, you should bear in mind or remember that you always need to minimize the number of threads, the times that threads are created and destroyed. Whenever you put Pragma OMP parallel four, you create and destroy. So if you parallelize the patterns independently, each pattern will come up with, will generate one parallel four. So we'll be creating and destroying threads twice per iteration of the simulation loop. So you need, you can try to cover the two loops under one single a parallel and parallel section. And finally, you can even try to move that out of the simulation loop. And this, this route is in general what experts do in the final versions that have linear speedups or where the performance scales with the number of threads, okay? So this is for the CPU side. We covered all these topics in the training courses of 2019 series. So you have plenty of examples and materials there to understand all of these topics with simpler examples <coughs> than CPIC. So feel free to ask so that we can point you to the appropriate materials and simple exercises, okay? For GPU, essentially it's the same, but finally, instead of minimizing the number of times threads are created and destroyed, you should minimize data movements. Number of times data is moved from CPU to GPU memory and from GPU memory back to the CPU memory. And again, have different parallel loops in one single data region and move the data region out of the simulation loop. So conceptually it's similar, the, the changes you need to do in the code, but looking at different optimization criteria, number of creation and destructions of, of threads and data movement, amount of volume of data that you need to move, okay? So there are similarities that you can reason about in, in terms of the code. Okay, so um, I think I have gone through the explanation of the main techniques, the steps, and shown you briefly how a parallel work can guide you by invoking the tools with the CP code. So now, during uh, five minutes or so, Javier will show you how to run on Cori PW report and PW loops with the CP uh, codes. And later, I will jump in again to discuss some performance numbers that we have so that you can know what you can expect at the end of the session. 